Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And we're going to continue looking at 1 Samuel and um, sorting through a lot of pieces of the puzzle. So I know it's not super exciting at this point, but uh, we, we definitely can see a lot of symbols here. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? The dear Father in heaven, we are, are grateful that we can come here again this morning. We can open your word and we ask for your light of truth to shine upon our darkness, our dark hearts, and that the sin that uh, shields us from you, that recoils from your presence, that that can be set aside and that we can see your mercy and love and acceptance of us. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you can bless each person who's studying, that you can lead us into all truth, help us as we seek your presence and be with us in this study. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again, everyone. So um, I, I always feel like apologizing because we're, we're, we're going to be going so slowly in this study. But uh, as we as we do so, uh, the reason we do so is, you know, as I've said many times, is that there's so many things that we often miss in reading the Bible. And, you know, I'm, I know um, in my own experience of reading the Bible, you know, when I first started reading the Bible, it didn't mean a lot to me. Lots of these things, you would read these stories, they just kind of blur into one. And, and one of the things that, that, I, that I noticed, you know, early on uh, is that there's a lot of repetition in Scripture. That is, <laughs> in these stories, we see a lot of the same elements showing up. And the way that uh, critics of the Bible address this is that they say these are, I um, can't remember the word they use. Um, see, it's one of those technical literary terms. But basically, it's like a motif. It's it's a repeated uh and they say that some something that has to do with the way that things are memorized, because these are memorized stories originally, and that they that these stories run in a certain pattern. They have a certain structure to them. I wish I could remember the word they use. But it basically, it's a type of, of pattern. So, But when we look at these patterns, we see that this is how God deals with people, and that, that some of these things can't really be explained just as literary devices. So you have your repeat enlargement to those. Yeah. So there's repeat in the large. And a lot of it has to do with understanding um, you know, Hebrew literature. You know, and a good example of that is is the creation story itself, where you have the first verse, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That is sort of like a title, but it's expanded on in in the rest of chapter one of Genesis. And then the next part, some people say, well, there's two different creation stories. You know, there's one where God creates the world and another one where he creates Adam and Eve. But this is simply how uh, Hebrew literature works, where you use a repeat and enlarge. So they expand upon the creation of Adam and Eve. It's not a different tradition of a creation story. It's the same story. And we see lot, lots of this throughout scripture. You see it in, in Hebrew poetry. And, and we see these patterns, these stories. When we went through the stories of the judges, uh, we, we kept seeing the same sort of patterns showing up again and again. Um, you know, another example that uh, we looked at when we looked at uh, uh, the book of Esther in, con in context of dealing with the book of Daniel. And we saw lots of parallels between how uh, the stories, the narratives in Esther occur as they occur in the book of Daniel. And, oh, that what they call it is a trope, a literary trope. I don't know if you've ever heard that expression. So obviously we see that this is not just some literary trope, that this these are real histories, and that uh, the way that these stories unfold and and the symbolism that's used is is used throughout scripture and and one of the books that really unlocks a lot of this of course all the prophecy does so when we look at these narratives we look at them as prophetic stories 
But you see in a book like the book of Revelation, where all of these symbols of scripture sort of come together, the book of Revelation ties uh, to so many other books. The symbolism comes from all of these different prophecies, all these different histories. You know, and a good example is um, when we looked at Genesis chapter three and we saw, you know, the serpent and the seed of the woman, right? You're going to see that same imagery used in, in Revelation chapter 12, where you see a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she pains to be delivered and she gives, you know, she gives birth to a man child, right? And the dragon is, the serpent there is waiting to devour the man child as soon as he is born, right? So these, these, uh, this type of imagery shows up again and again. So even in this story of, of Hannah, having this child, Samuel, he becomes a prophetic symbol. He becomes typical of something that's uh, that's happened uh, prophetically. And then when we take these things and we apply them to to our time, what are we doing? How How is it that we can take these old stories from you know, thousands of years ago and see in these stories um, parallels to events that are happening today? What, what is the basis for doing that? Uh, some people just think it's sort of uh, reading into scripture something that's not there. Well, there's a spiritual application to everything. Okay, well, not just, not just, not just, not just yeah. yeah, go on. Explain it oh, more. No, that's, that's it. <laughs> well, <laughs> so we have 1 Corinthians 10 11. Now, all these things happen unto them for in samples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now, I'm not going to go into all the, the stories that he's referring to, but but we, we know that this refers to all of Scripture, that these are in samples. Now, the word there in Greek is the word tupos, which is where we get the word type, right? So these are all types. And um, so, so we can say that they're types. But now when we make an application to our time, we know that there's an application, of course, to the time of Christ as well. And, and some people will take these things and just say, oh, they're like, you know, devotional, right? We can learn the lessons. It's more to like uh, you have a story uh, in scripture and then you have your little, the moral of the story is, you know, whatever it is, right? Like we have children's stories and we say, well, here's the moral of the story. It'd be a lot um, deeper than that. If you think it'd be yeah, a lot deeper than that. Yeah, it's a lot deeper than just a moral, right? And and some people use the Bible more, what we use this term devotional way. You know, it's kind of like, you know, that you get these morals. So you read the Bible and and, and you can... Uh, you know, personally identify with some of the characters and things in your life, right? So, um, you know, you learn, it, but that's still just, the Bible is deeper than that. Um, and of course, we've used the example before uh, when it comes to DNA. DNA encodes information and it can be read up and down, left and right. So imagine if English was that way, that when you, you read it, you could get information by reading down or forwards or backwards like a palindrome. So up or down, backward or forward, and also, you know, three-dimensionally. So you could even go like in and out. So this, this sort of complexity that's in scripture, why would God do it this way? Like, why doesn't God just, you know, just tell us certain things just in plain, simple language. Why, why does he, he take all of this information and have it sort of encoded? Well, why do we dig for, why do people dig for treasures, you know? Okay, right. Why does God put uh, nuts that are high in proteins and fats, why does he put them in a shell, right? It, it's that there are things that, that we have to, we have to work for things, right? You know, thing, everything is not just given to us. And it's part of character development. 
So God is developing in us a Christ-like character. But also we can see that God can be speaking to every single person on earth through the same scripture, even though that scripture on the surface means certain things, that is, everything we find, it never contradicts the plain statements of scripture. So we don't look for like new hidden secret doctrines that contradict what God plainly says, right? So when we're digging in the scriptures, we're looking for, for light that supports what the scriptures plainly say. Now, Jesus says, I've written all these things before time, or, or says, no, it doesn't get it mixed up. He says, I've told you all these things beforehand, that when they come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Right. So prophecy is a powerful evidence of God's foreknowledge and care. So anyway, we're gonna we're gonna go over just a few things. We're gonna I'm gonna read these verses that we've had so far in First Samuel. Now there was a certain man of Ramathiam Zophim, so of this double height of watchers. And, and that word watchers is a word that we see in Ezekiel chapter 3 and 33. Um, so watchman of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Joram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephrathite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly or year by year, to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, who's his, his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are pr the priests of the Lord, were there. And when time was that Elkanah offered, he gave Peninnah, Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters, portions, that is, um, something weighed out, so a division, a ration, a lot, right? Uh, but unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion or a double portion, for he loved Hannah, and the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary went so year by uh, adversary also provoked her sore or to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. So, so just to those first six verses, we looked at that there are these names, and, and we can we look at the meanings of the names. We have symbols attached to the names in their meanings, and, and there's still a lot more that we can do. But at this point, we're just kind of doing this summary. But so we have Elkanah, his name uh, comes from uh, the word El, which is the name of God. And it's either 410 or 411 that that the Hebrew number but the name Elkanah is 511. So when you put those two, there's lots of words that are names that start with L, right? That start with the name of God. And then Elkanah, the latter part, the 7069 part of his name, the Elkanah part. We, so we had it as God is owned or possessed, but it, it, it comes from a word that means to erect, that is to create which by extension means to procure, especially by purchase, uh, by implication to own, attain. Okay, so what is it that we're seeking to obtain? So, you know, like the question is, who, who does Elkanah represent? Does he represent us? Does he represent God? How, how would we look at Elkanah himself? And then he's going to have two wives, right? So women represent a church, and, and we have this doubling, right? So this idea of the two classes. We have the could, he one, represent, could he represent the state in some way? Well, I don't think so. Um, you know, I, I think he could represent God in this sense. But, you know, I don't know. I'm just, you know, asking questions. But would it be that he represents those who um, are seeking to be redeemed? Yeah, he could be that too, right? So those that are developing uh, or creating or purchasing a, a righteous character. It, it's hard to know at this point. 
but we're just asking these questions. What, who he represents and what he represents. That he has two wives, you know, and we, we see this, you know, because often there's a criticism made of Adventism regarding Leviticus 16, where you have the Lord's goat and the scapegoat. And um, one of the criticisms I run into online is uh, because there's people who read a lot of anti-Adventist websites and they they don't really study things themselves. They just find things on the Internet about Adventists and they like attacking us. But one of the things that we believe is that uh, Christ is our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary and we're in the anti-typical Day of Atonement and in Leviticus 16. On the Day of Atonement, there's going to be these various offerings for the priest, um, for the king, for the common people, for the individual, these sin offerings. And then there's going to be these two particular sin offerings, one one for the Lord and one for Azazel or the scapegoat. And some Christians think that the scapegoat represents Christ's offering. Now, it's it's probably the most common view just because of superficial reading it wasn't very common in the past most uh, commentators in the past would see in azazel a symbol of satan because of the name which azazel is a demon uh, but also it's fitting in type in the sanctuary so in the yearly service you know sins go into the sanctuary and then on the day of atonement uh, the lord's goat which has no sins confessed upon it uh, cleanses the sanctuary and then the high priest comes out and takes those sins from the sanctuary and places them upon the head of the scapegoat and so we have there these two goats that's the main point that i'm making here right now just like we have these two women and i do believe that uh the lord's goat represents not just christ but christ and his character in his people and that Azazel represents Satan and Satan's followers in a, in a certain sense. These two, the separation of these two classes. And of course, we see this in the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Right. So it's not just that there's a seed of the woman. The woman doesn't just have a seed in Genesis 3.15. But the serpent also has a seed. And that there's enmity between the seed of the woman and between uh, the seed of the serpent. And we see this here in Hannah and Peninnah, right? There's this enmity between these two wives, right? So however we're going to deal with these, however we're going to put this on a line, however we're going to understand it, one thing we see is that this is a message that symbolized there's lots of doublings in this section. And it is the second me angel's message that is Babylon is fallen is fallen. And in Revelation 18, in the repetition of that message, which is our history, which we believe arrived at 9-11, that that's where this come out of her, my people, that you receive not of her plagues, etc., is applying. So that we're living in a time where God is going to separate Hannah from Peninnah. He's going to separate the Lord's goat, in a sense, from Azazel. He's going to represent, uh, separate the sheep from the goats. The, 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 the par in the parable of the virgins, you have the wise and the foolish, right? And God does that through a proclamation of a message. That is, God doesn't arbitrarily just separate people. That there is truth that is presented and we make a choice. God gives us all a choice. Choose life or death. Why would you die? Why would you choose death? God asks. And so, but God is choosing, giving us an opportunity for life. But some people choose death. So, so there's, so we need to somehow, you know, keep all of these things in mind as we go through this. And any other observations so far of what we've, we've seen? Okay. So now when we get at verse seven, as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. Now, so this is going to be when he did so year by year. What is that referring to? Who's the he? Elkanah. Okay, so Elkanah, right? 
Now, it also says that um, in, in verse 3, um, and this man went up out of his city yearly or year by year. In King James, they translate the same phrase two different ways, in two different verses. So it's going to be as he did so year by year. Okay, let's read verse 6 and 7 together. And her adversary also provoked her sore or to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. Now, it could be read, and I don't think this is how you would read it. Um, but sometimes we know that the personal pronoun can re refer to the antecedent, right? Is that the right word? Anyway, it refers to whoever you referred to before, right? So it's talking about the Lord shut up her womb. But it, when it says, as he did so year by year, that's not referring to the Lord shutting up her womb year by year. It's referring to Elkanah year by year going up. So in a sense, we almost look at part of that, uh, those verses as parenthetical. They're fitting in between this story of Elkanah when he offered. Right, He's going to go up year by year to worship. And when the time was that he offered, now, is that every time that he's giving uh, Hannah a double portion? Like, Because this isn't really the inheritance. It's not talking about the inheritance because it seems that this is something that he does every time he goes up to the house of the Lord. But also, at the same time, we're going to have Peninnah. She's going to provoke her, that is Hannah. At these times, does, does that make sense to people? And, or I'm I'm not reading this correctly. I think you are making sense. Okay. Right. So so why does her adversary provoke her sore and make her fret at this point of time? And because she had, oh. what, what would be the reason? Angela, did you have a Peter comment? With the sons of God. I mean, this is what it. Reminds me of uh, Satan was intruding in God's counsel. Okay, I don't understand. Explain. No, well, that just came to me because here we have, have people that are in sincerity going up to the house of God. They're they're performing a service for God, and they, their hearts seem to be right with God. And then you have somebody coming in with in, intruding, invading, and causing discord. Or attempt okay, to you cause discord and breach. And just like Satan, you know, Job, you know, skin for skin, what will a man give for his life? I will provoke him and, you know, I'll make him stand against you. It's the okay. same motive. You know, you can see it. I can see it quite clearly. Okay, so when when people are choosing to follow God, those that are, this is that enmity that happens when somebody is choosing to follow God. Uh, it's It's, part of it has to do with this, spirit of jealousy or whatever we want to call it. So even though Penina is the one that's being blessed with children, you know, and Hannah is the one that, you know, appears to be, you know, cursed by not having children, you would think Penina would have more sympathy and understanding and kindness, right? Like there's no reason for her to be jealous. Now, of course, her husband is giving a double portion at this time to Hannah, and maybe that is what is causing Penina to provoke Hannah, right? Because she sees that there is this favor being given to Hannah. Does, does that make sense? Yes, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Kate, Jeff, do you have a comment? She yes. That. This woman knew that she was not. Yeah, it's just, you know, why would somebody who's who's basically blessed uh, be, you know, giving a hard time on a person who's obviously having a hard time already? <laughs> you know, um, so obviously it's it's not a godly spirit in doing that. Now yeah, I'm just looking here. So we don't know exactly what this means, that Hannah was given a double portion, but it, it is definitely symbolic of the double portion, that inheritance, even though Hannah has no children. 
And 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 I would translate uh, 1 Samuel 1, verse 5, which you don't see there, but it says, But unto Hannah he gave a double portion, for he loved Hannah, even though the Lord had shut up her womb, right? It says, but the Lord has shut up her womb in the King James. But I would just say, you know, that what it really means is in spite of that fact. And then also her adversary provoked her sore for to make her fret or to try to make her angry because the Lord had shut up her womb. Well, it doesn't really. So is she trying to get her to be angry at God? Is the question. Well, don't Satan always try to make us make us uh, be angry at God? Yeah, because that's what it seems like to me. Now, the word "because" is um, it's just key. That's uh, kaf and yod. So it's 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 not. I mean, they, it's it's a um, a causal primitive participle and. Uh, full full form of the prepositional prefix. So prefix. So it's often added to the word. So it can be translated lots of different ways. So it could, you know, we have here is because, but it could be um, translated as uh, so, then, in, how, right? So, uh, so the way the King James translators have chosen to translate it because the Lord had shut up her womb, it, it's giving the impression that that she's trying to get Hannah to be angry at the Lord because of her situation. Right. That's that's the way I take it. Now, it could be she's just, you know, because the Lord has shut up her womb, that that's why she's mocking her or, or you know, bugging her. Um, that could be the other way that it could be taken. So anyway, as Elkanah did so year by year, not the Lord, when she went up to the house of the Lord, that's when she's going to be provoked by Peninnah, and then therefore she wept and did not eat. So at these times when she's going to seek God, that's when she's going to be the most distraught, and that's when she's going to be the most provoked, right? So as Angela pointed out, that this is... You know, Satan trying to get in between us and God, right? Trying to discourage Hannah, okay? And we know that this is going to be three times a year that they go up to the house of the Lord. And then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So here we have from Patriarchs and Prophets, even amid the sacred festivities connected with the service of God, the evil spirit that had cursed his home intruded. After presenting the thank offerings, all the family, according to the established custom, united in a solemn yet joyous feast. Upon these occasions, Elkanah gave the mother of his children a portion for herself and for each of her sons and daughters. And in token of regard for Hannah, he gave her a double portion, signifying that his affection for her was the same as if she had had a son. Right. So so Alan White here gives what I thought because I hadn't read this quote yet. So when they're going to have this feast, when they're they're celebrating, you know, thank, you know, after they give their thank offerings and they have this joyous feast that Hannah is given a double portion as, as a symbol, right? Even though she doesn't have sons. And then it says, then the second wife fired with jealousy, claimed the pre precedence as one highly favored of God and taunted Hannah with her childless state as evidence of the Lord's displeasure. This was repeated from year to year until Hannah could endure it no longer. Unable to hide her grief, she wept without restraint and withdrew from the feast. Her husband vainly sought to comfort her. Why weepest thou? Why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? He said, am I not better to thee than ten sons? So, so we have this picture here. What is this picture representing then? Just in, in the broadest sense. I know it's to ask something in the broadest sense should be the simplest. Would you repeat your question? Okay, so we have this, this paragraph here. And so what? 
what does this represent? This 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 narrative in the broadest sense. We the have church. A, okay, uh, the church. The so, so Alcana would be who? Who is giving this double portion to Hannah? What does Hannah represent? What does Penina represent? We've already touched on it to some degree, but does Elkanah represent God? Yes. Okay. And why why would you say that? Because if we if we take that in this in this way, Elkanah would represent God. Peniah would represent the church. Hannah would represent the movement. Okay. Okay, so that's getting a bit more specific. That's not as broad. But we, we would say uh, Elkanah represents God and Hannah represents those that follow God and Peninnah represents those that don't. But they have a form of godliness, right? So we would represent those within the church, the two classes, right? Two classes of worshipers that we always talk about. Would you consider would you consider it being a ten verse? Okay, William and then Jeff. So William? Would it be could you consider it like the ten virgins? Yeah, so well, the parable of the ten Yeah. It illustrates the same thing. You have the ten virgins. So that's an illustration of two classes. And Jeff? Yeah, it's the same thing as uh, William did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we see that these are worshipers. Now, in the context of Scripture, when it talks about a message that's going to the everlasting gospel, the gospel comes to every man. and But it produces two classes of worshipers. We see this in Cain and Abel. You know, Cain, I mean, he, he gives an offering, but the offering is not the offering that's required of God. Right? He just gives, you know, what what he has had from uh, the field, right? His, because he's a gardener. Uh, Abel is going to give, you know, an animal as a sacrifice, which is required by God. So one represents looking at Christ as a substitute. The other one is offering his own works. And often people who are, you know, and it says here, it's kind of interesting. Then the second wife, fired with jealousy, claimed the precedence as one highly favored of God. Now, the word Hannah means favored, right? Where Penina means pearls, right? Or, or jewels or, or something like that. So there are those that think that they are favored, right? They think that they're because of their works, because of their characteristics, because of, of, of the blessings that God has actually given them, that somehow they deserve salvation, right? They they sort of earned it. Their good um, works are, are their jewels. Yeah. But Hannah, her righteousness, her blessings, her favor is based upon God's mercy, right? Not upon what she has accomplished. So you can see here with Penina, she has she's produced children. So her husband should favor her. That is, we've done many wonderful works. You know, we've cast out demons, we've preached the gospel, and, you know, we deserve to be in heaven, right? You know, we're smart, we're intelligent, we're educated. Um, you know, why are you going to show any favor towards these people who appear unworthy? But God grants his mercy to those who are lowly. Right. Not to the great men, not many mighty. Right. It's those that have have learned in the school of Christ who have been humbled that are going to enter into God's kingdom. So what's being illustrated here is the gospel. Right. This is an illustration of the everlasting gospel. So that's in the broadest sense what we see. Now, as we go through this story, we're going to start to to apply it to the movement, right, to what has happened uh, within this movement, but also what is happening presently. So I believe in God's providence as we study that he will show us things that are needful. That is, he gives us light for our feet. And we have all kinds of questions and all kinds of things that we're struggling with, both on a personal level, 
uh, the trials that we are going through, uh, but also uh, on, on a bigger level and what is our role in, in these last days? What is it that God's asking us to do individually, but also in relation to others, relation to the church, relation, relation to those that we study with, that we have contact with? What is God asking us to do? And a one thing that we can see is that we should be weeping. We should be fasting, as Hannah here is, uh, because we should be grieved, right? Not that we're angry at God, but we, we need to be seeking that there is there's something more that has to happen in our lives, right? Okay. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now, Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. So we have a footnote here. It just talks here about ere the lamp of God went out of the temple of the Lord where the ark was and Samuel was laid down to sleep. So that's going to be later. It's going to talk about this lamp. But I don't know why they give us that reference. But those are the to translator's reference. Uh, a seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. Okay. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Uh, so upon a seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. So so Eli is is sort of at, where would he be sitting exactly? To the front of the um, tabernacle. Is, is it right in front of the tabernacle itself, or is it in the court? Yeah, because it seems to me that he's like right by the tabernacle. But generally, um, and, and remember, this is um, t- because you're going to have the courtyard, and then you're going to have the tabernacle itself. Right. And I, I don't think that she would have come, because normally the worshiper just comes to the to the they don't go into the courtyard but the priests are in the courtyard so i'm trying to picture where this exactly would be i'm just going to try to do a search here so this is a door post or a side post that word post um word seat there it kisse kisse properly covered that is a throne or as canopied a seat a stool a throne I would understand that uh, those who are making an offering would go into the inner court, sorry, well, the outer court, and uh, bring a lamb there, and then they would lay their hands on it, and the priest, whatever they they would, or the priest would sort of help, and the person would then kill the lamb. So I believe that would be happening before the altar section. So it would be in the outer court, but not as far yeah. as the altar. Or about that area. Right. So so you have the the courtyard, like in, in the sanctuary. They would come to that courtyard, and then that blood would be brought into the courtyard. Right? They wouldn't go past the altar, past the labor, to the door of the t- of the sanctuary. Right? Am I correct? They wouldn't go all the way in there. They would just come to, to the courtyard. Yeah, that would be my my understanding. So just that's always been my in the front. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's that's what I understood. Have always understood that would would happen. Um, yeah. So this would be at the, what we would call the gate leading into the inner court of the tabernacle. That's what you know. A commentator says whether that's correct or not. That's the way that I've understood it. Now, some some people take it as one of the posts of the temple, right? But of course, here we have this as being, this is the sanctuary, so it's not really the temple per se. So there's going to be different opinions about how to understand this. But my understanding is that you don't go into the inner court. You just go to that door. So that's where I would think that Eli would be. But So what does that represent? In, in, the, in the stage of salvation of the everlasting gospel, what, where is she in this experience? So uh, justification. 
Yeah, so it's this justification. So we would look at this as the first angel's message, right? You know, I'm not sure how we're going to draw this out yet. I haven't been able to put this together yet. I don't have enough pieces, but we'll figure it out. But when we look at it in our experience, if I look in my personal experience, at least I can witness of that, this reminds me of my conversion, right? That bitterness of soul, praying to the Lord, weeping, you know, God take over my life. You know, I've made a mess of it. So I would say it's that first step there, justification. Any thoughts on that? So replacing this as being the first step of the three steps. Yeah. I can't see that that's incorrect. Yeah, okay. And now we know that there's lots of symbols here about the second angel's message in this. That is primarily this story is about the second angel's message. But you can't have a third without a first and second, and you can't have a second without a first. Right? Right. So, I mean, if we were going to apply this to Millerite history, we would have to look at this as the arrival of the first angel's message. You know, if we were going to put this as a parallel, you know, the parable of the ten virgins, the two classes. Right? So we see uh, these two classes here demonstrated. The one who's being adversarial Right. And the other one uh, who is being persecuted or bitter and seeks God. So that's how I would do it. Hopefully everyone agrees. Or if, if I'm wrong, hopefully somebody shows me. <laughs> but it, to me, it seems the most logical. OK. Just some quotes from Job about bitterness of soul. Well, that's pretty apt from Job. OK. Now, 1 Samuel 1, verse 11, she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give unto him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Right? So we can see that... Um, uh, this word man-child, in the Hebrew, it's a seed of men, right? We can see how that relates to the promised seed, to the everlasting gospel. But this vowing of a vow, we have a doubling, right? Right. Could this then be the second angel's message? Or we... All right. Now, of course, vow to vow, one is a verb and the other is a noun, right? Uh, nadar and netter, right? So they are different words, but they are basically the same word, just in two different forms. So the vowel pointing is different, but in, in the consonants in Hebrew, they'd be the same. And and of course, when when they use something like this, in dying ye shall die, vowing a vow, uh, captivity captive, things like that, uh, those are a... Um, in, in Hebrew, that's the way they say, you know, like uh, a multitude of captives or ye shall surely die or, you know, so it's, it's, uh, I always forget the word, but it's, 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 um, I know it starts with E. Anyway, it, it, it shows the intensity of it, right? So she didn't just vow, she vowed, right? But she vowed a vow. And, and so we see this doubling here. Anything else that would uh, tie this to the second angel's message? In this, she's attempting to give glory to God for everything because she's, at, you know, she's recognizing that without the power of God, she would not have a child. Right. And if we look at this as, you know, fear God, give him glory for the hour's judgment has come. The first angel's message uh, being justification, the second sanctification. This is the work of sanctification. So she has um, come to God in affliction, right, in in bitterness of spirit. And now she is depending upon God for righteousness, that the character of Christ can be formed in her. And that's that is a work of justification, but it's also a commitment that 
that continual commitment of justification is the work of sanctification. Right? Okay. Right? So she's asking for the seed of men, that Christ's character can be formed in her. So it's a dependent upon God for righteousness. That's that's giving glory, you know, to God, right? That's how we give glory to God, depending upon him for righteousness. Two other items that are intriguing in the in just in this symbolically in this verse. We have four ones. Yeah, first Samuel one verse eleven. Yeah. I was thinking about that. So is this is this a representation of the three angels message of Revelation fourteen and the fourth. The, and the 18. fourth in eighteen. That's possible. You know, that just there's it represents the first, second, third, and fourth angels message. That's possible. I no. mean we also know that we have Daniel eleven eleven, which is the second angel's message, right? Okay. Raphia. Wow, it's you know, midnight, but connected to the second angel's message. So, I mean, you could say, you know, two 11s, right? If, if you want to, 1 Samuel is an 11, and then verse 11. So it also represents 22, because 11 generations to the flood, 11 generations to entering into Egypt, the 22 generations. The 11 years from Joseph's two dreams to the butler and baker's two dreams, and then the 11 years to Joseph's dream being fulfilled, the 22 years. So, I mean, there's ways that we could look at that. The January 11th date also that that we've had symbolized in our lines. So I'm not sure where we're going to necessarily put this, but I see things attached to the second angel's message. Now, we also see... You know, when it talks about this man child and when there's no razor coming up on his head, what does that remind us of? Samson. So Samson, yeah. And Samson his, is connected to the Nazarite vow, which doesn't have anything to do with being a Nazarene per se. But we, we connect that symbol because of that uh, with with Christ as well. Well, here the other thing that's interesting. Let's remember that Samson's father's name is given in the Bible, Manoah. Yeah. And Manoah means rest. Yeah, and it's it's really the word uh, Noah with a mem at the beginning. Okay, so it's actually Noah. Okay, interesting. Well, well it is. Yeah, it, it's the name Noah, but it has a prefix, uh, the letter M which means technically like from rest. Noah means rest. Okay, but in the situation, Noah is in the feminine form. Noek is in the masculine form. Is that not correct? Uh, I don't know. I'd have to look at it. Okay. Um, I've never noticed that before, but... Well, what, what I had noticed, there are those... When when you look at Noah, as I just pronounced it, yeah. that that actually means wanderer, where Noah means rest. Yeah, I'd have to I'd have to look at it. I've never seen Noah being wanderer. I've always seen Noah as rest. But you know, it's just maybe it's a pronunciation thing in English, but in Hebrew. The name Noah means rest, and the name Manoah means rest. Okay, but in in, their, in our situation, yeah, if this is part of the Nazarite vow, then Samuel was committed from his birth mm-hmm. to never let a razor come upon his head, but he was also committed not to make use of wine. Right. Yeah, now it could be, of course, in in here that this is kind of a shortcut instead of adding all those details. Right. That it's just implied if his hair is not going to be cut, all of those other aspects of the Nazarite vow would be added to it. But it doesn't say that. So 
but but at least that's part of what we see in the net, the idea that he's not going to cut his hair. Uh, but she's seeing this as some kind of consecration at the very least. Correct. Giving him to God. And and in doing so, she's just not going to cut his hair. Whether there's other restrictions, it doesn't say. But we can see how this relates to, to Christ. And, and the idea here then, again, is that this is symbolic of, of Christ's character in his people. Like this is the work of sanctification, developing a Christ-like character. So anything else about this verse? Not that I can think of at the moment. Okay. Okay, and we're going to go over these verses again. We're going to deal with a lot more detail, but for now we're just trying to get the basic idea of these stories, what's happening and how they relate to the messages. It came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now, they say here, Hebrew multiplied to pray, and as she multiplied to pray before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now, so marked, a, marked her mouth. He just noticed her mouth moving. That's it. <laughs> no, I got you. Yeah, so I don't know about this word multiplied. I mean, I, I don't know if I'd translate it that way. Basically, it would be like, uh, it's the word rabba. As she increased her prayers, maybe that would be better, right? Because it means, you know, like an abundance to bring in an abundance. But yeah, I don't think we'd ever say somebody multiplied to pray in English. Um, so it's not just that she continued praying, that she's she's increasing her earnestness in prayer, right? So now she's becoming more earnest, and in doing so, she's not just Praying silently, she's actually moving her lips, right? Even though she's not speaking out loud, right? She's just speaking in her heart, but her lips moved, her, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken, which not sure why he would think that. But so, what is what is who is Eli, and what is his his part to play in this in this story? Of, of Hannah. Would he be church leadership? Okay, well, yeah. <laughs> he definitely is, right? Okay. Um, and, and, and we know that from uh, lots of things dealing with his character and uh, his son's characters, right? That we would see later in this story. So how would this relate if we were going to relate it to church leadership and we're going to apply it to... Uh, our experience church leadership has been very dismissive of the movement yeah and basically you know basically you're drunk you got false prof you know false doctrine right correct right so now of course it's not all leadership but it's pretty common in leadership and and why is that what what's the problem with leadership because they would prefer people just to, as the old adage says, pay, pray, and obey. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking more just symbolically here in this story. Okay. Now, Hannah spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken. So, so what's happening? How would we apply this? <clears throat> What does it mean if her voice is not heard symbolically? What's the problem? She's moving her lips. Okay. Nothing's, nothing's uh, relayed. No, message is not being relayed. Or... Okay. And, and in some ways, you know, we could say that has, has the leadership heard the message when they, like they've just uh, judged by appearances without, without hearing the message. You know, I mean, this, this is, you know, a difficulty that we have to, you know, it, it's a difficult thing, right? Because we know God's, God's people, um, that there is, there's two classes of worshipers within Adventism. And, and we want to be in the class that's going to represent God. And that means we have to learn of the meekness and lowliness of Christ. And we're not seeking, um, 
you know, she's not seeking anything from Eli, right? Correct. Okay. She's seeking God. Now, part of the problem is, why is Eli even interfering? Why is he even involved here? She's not seeking anything from him. Because he believes that he is in the place of intercessor between God and the children of Israel. Yeah. Is that why he's sitting at the, the door of the courtyard there? He wants to be acknowledged. Yeah. Yeah. That, and, and that's, that's a problem that, um, you know, that we see in the church is it, it well, I think even back to the times of the upper room Bible studies. So, you know, I've talked about this many times, but you know, we're just new Adventists, a whole bunch of us. We decide to have a Bible study on Saturday nights. We don't know anything about, you know, conferences and leadership or anything like that. We just want to have a Bible study. And the church sees this as a threat. You know, and some spies come and they report back to uh, the leadership that, you know, we're studying offshoot material and, you know, and, uh, you know, we're some kind of fanatical group and we, and, and they're just jealous, right? I guess, or something. I have no idea what their motives were in giving a false report about us. Thankfully, the youth pastor came to the study a couple of times and he gave a good report, but that didn't actually undo all of the bad reports that the leadership got. So, you know, we were blacklisted and not me in particular because it was my house. Um, and that's never been removed, right? It's always been marked out throughout my history as an Adventist that, you know, Theodore is a troublemaker. So I'm marked, right? He marked her mouth, but he doesn't know what's being said, right? He doesn't, he doesn't ask either. What she no. was, exactly what she was. Yeah. Now, of course, Eli in this case is going to, you know, say whatever, you know, you've God, you know, you've talked to God. And so he's, he's not necessarily a bad guy, right? <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's still going to say, you know, God, you know, should answer your prayer. So when we, and Eli said to her, how long wilt thou be drunk and put away thy wine from thee? So, so we can see, we know that wine is a symbol of doctrine and, and that this has often been asked of people. You know, you're basically teaching false doctrine. Stop it, right? And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. So obviously, alcohol, the kind of doctrine that gets you drunk, is false doctrine, right? True doctrine is uh, is not fermented, right? Um, now, in uh, the alternate translation here, they say, Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I'm a woman, heart of spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Um, now, they have sor sorrowful spirit in the King James. The translators also said heart of spirit. Now, that word, uh, 7185, uh, kasheh, means severe, churlish, cruel, grievous, uh, hard, hearted, heavy, you know, it means lots of different things. But I, I think um, stiff necked is another um, stubborn. And, and I think that's that's probably how I would translate this. It's not just that she's sorrowful, right, or bitter, but that she's being persistent, right? She's seeking God earnestly. Right. And that would go along with the multiplying her prayers, right? This, her prayer was multiplied. Her praying was multiplied. She is seeking God earnestly. That's what she says. Now, we have seen this, too, where people, people generally, you know, who, who become very sincere in wanting to know the truth and begin studying, that that becomes a threat to others, right? So... They don't they don't like seeing somebody being so earnest because it's it's a condemnation of them. But anyway, she goes on, says, count not thine handmaid a daughter of Belial. 
for out of abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Now, a daughter of Belial is, uh, uh, Belial just means like worthless. Uh, it is also a name uh, as well. So she's not wicked, right? Daughter, of course, Bath. Bath. Um, so she's she's not a daughter of Belial. For out of the abundance of my complaint, uh, which would be her prayer, and grief, which is also anger. I have spoken hitherto. Now, the word hitherto at this time is really what it's referring to. Up until this time. So that's why they have hitherto. Okay. <clears throat> Any, anything we see here that we can bring up meditation instead of complaint is another option. Now, now, thankfully, Eli says, um, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. So at least Eli isn't going to continue opposing her. Now, this is 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1, verse 17. Of course, we know 11 times 17 is 187. Um, I don't know if that has anything to do with, with that, but... <clears throat> So what do we see here? What is Eli then doing? I mean, obviously, he's not opposing her any longer. Can Eli represent the leadership still here as well? Why couldn't well, maybe it be a leadership that's more tolerant? Okay. Okay. And Dwight? Why couldn't it? Okay. So how, how, how would it be representing what aspect? Like tolerance that, that is also shown, or is there something else? I think there's something deeper here. Yeah, I know. But I don't know what it is. Okay. So if we take this as the July 18, 2020 prediction, right? If we take take that symbolism, 11 times 17 is 187. And we look at this petition that thou hast asked of him. So if we apply this to the prediction that failed, right? So we know we have a failed prediction. Is it that that through the leadership that that somehow they will see or somehow this this blessing, this transformation of character can have an effect. I don't, I don't know how to put it, really. I mean, this is a gracious act on the part of Eli. So the one thing the one thing I I object to um, that I've seen manifested in this movement is this. Uh, anger towards the church, towards leadership. And of course, when you see people that anger at leadership, they're going to turn their anger on each other as well, as we saw that happen in the movement. But I, I've never been a fan of being angry towards the church, even when you're mistreated by the church. Because the church is made up of individuals, right? There is no such thing as the church other than the individuals within the church. Correct? I mean, obviously, there's a groups of individuals that can act, but, and, and sometimes people go along with the bullies, right? Because they don't want to be bullied. But I've never had any sort of anger against some, some immaterial thing such as a church. And, and I definitely don't have anger towards any individuals, even individuals who've been very mean and mistreated me in lots of different ways. I don't have any anger towards them. I don't have any bitterness. And and I and I still even people who have, you know, spread terrible rumors and gossip about me through the years, I still love them and care for them and am seeking to to minister to them, to reach them in some way. So I do believe that we're going to see a change. Not not in the corporate structure per se but in individuals and that, that there are individuals who, who wish us well and, and do say, go in peace in the God of Israel, grant thee thy petition. I've experienced that from people in leadership, right? In, not, not directly in those words, but in the idea that um, they don't seek ill will, ill of me either. They don't seek, seek my harm. 
right? That they're they're actually carrying. They just they've just seen the lips moving, and and, and haven't heard the message, right? And and at some point, some of these people will be reached. So it's individuals that we're reaching, not institutions. Any thoughts on that? My my thoughts. Those are my my views. Angela has a comment dealing with uh, the Nazarite vow, which is found in number 6-5, referring to the 65 years of Isaiah 7, verse 8, which goes from 742 to 677. This was for Ephraim, later Judah. Elkanah was an Ephraimite. Well, it's possible. It's, it's kind of a lot of different connections there to get to that point. But is possible um, whether we directly relate it to this story or not <clears throat> now one of the things that we we think about with this um, this story is that um, that this this is illustrating the first second and third angels messages or at least the first and second angels message or primarily the second angels message in a history that's prior to the anointing of Saul. And we take the position that Saul, David, and Solomon represent the first, second, and third angels' messages, which we're, we're going to get into as we get through this understanding of these, this king, the kingdom of Israel as the United Kingdom in that history, that 120 years. But this is the, this is the history that precedes it. So we know even though it's in a period of darkness that these messages, God's dealings with men is ever the same. So it's not a major reform line in these lines, but we, we see these, maybe we could say the seeds of these messengers, or at least we see this reform line here um, dealing with Samuel. And, and it's going to typify what's going to happen. So there are things being illustrated here that uh, we will end up coming back to again and again. So she says, let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat and her countenance was no more sad. Now we see sad there is, is in italics in the King James. Now, of course, that's just trying to, now her face was no more, is all it says in Hebrew, right? So they put sad there. <clears throat> okay, so just keep that in mind. Okay, now Hannah uttered no reproach. The burden which she sh could share with no earthly friend she cast upon God. Earnestly she pleaded that he would take away her reproach and grant her the precious gift of a son to nurture and train for him. She made a solemn vow that if her request were granted, she would dedicate her child to God even from its birth. Hannah had drawn near to the entrance of the tabernacle, and in the anguish of her spirit she prayed and wept sore, yet she communed with God in silence, uttering no sound. In those evil times, such scenes of worship were rarely witnessed. A reverent feasting and even drunkenness were not uncommon, even at the religious festivals. And Eli, the high priest, observing Hannah, supposed that she was overcome with wine. Thinking to administer a deserved rebuke, she said sternly, How long wilt thou be drunken and put away thy wine from thee? And if we think in the context of our time, is drunkenness really common within Adventism on a spiritual level? Lots of false doctrines floating around. Yes. Right? There's a lot and, of and you can see, wine. Yeah, and you can see why the church reacted in the way it did to some degree to our message. And that's because they just saw it as another false doctrine, right? They didn't take the time to look at it. But Satan had already paved the way. Some are drinking real wine, too. Yeah. Yes, I know. But we're, we're dealing with spiritual here. So pained and startled, Hannah answered gently, No, my Lord, I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine hand made for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. A high priest was deeply moved, for he was a man of God, and in place of rebuke he uttered a blessing. Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. Now, I do believe that in spite of all the things that have happened, um, that there will be a time in which people will actually listen to what we are saying. 
and and I think, of course, you know that uh, I mean, lots of people in the movement who bless the movement. They many of them, they were the ones doing the damage. Like, I don't think I would have ever had any problems in my local church if it wasn't for other people. If I had just presented, you know, what I had been studying, it would have been received. But so much bias had already been built up because of. The church, the conference, and and it was because of people who were really uh, causing trouble, like real trouble, instead of just acting in a Christ-like way and presenting what they were studying. But but we can see how you know even in my early years, the church did blacklist me, even though I wasn't doing anything wrong. So, but I do believe that 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 this message is going to be heard by individuals in leadership. And some will respond favorably. But that's not our, we're not looking for their approbation in order to feel that what we're doing is correct. We know it's correct because it's from God's word. Okay, so um, we're not going to look at this next verse, but just uh, notice that it's uh, 119. And we usually have that as a symbol of 11-9, November 9th, or also 9-11. But uh, we're not going to read that right now. So any any final thoughts on what we're doing so far? Like we're going to come back over this. We're going to, just like we did with Judges, we went over things again and again, kept gleaning the fields. But at least we're getting an idea of how the story is put together. And there's definitely a lot of symbols that we're going to have to dig for. Okay. So um, let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time here this morning. And again, we ask that you can be with each one of us as we go through our day. We pray that you can bring us back again to open your word and that we can think about these things throughout the day. We know that um, there's much we still have to learn. We ask that we can be obedient to the light that you have given us. Help us to be faithful. We pray for one another. We ask for your angel's care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.